coffees? Thank you. I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Laura Sands and I'm the chair and sort of um, founder with many of the trustees here who we've been on a long journey um, creating the Food Foundation and it's fantastic to see so many people here today sort of both celebrating our first report but also our existence. So, um, but I also want to thank all of you. Um, some of you have been, you know, uphill, down dale. Um, some people are still actually on their way here, having investigated the flower market, the fruit market, um, and the car parks, and some of the recycling units. <laughs> but this is an exciting site to be on, and I'm so pleased that you've been able to make it here um, to this particular part of the market. It's going through a huge amount of refurbishment and we are incredibly lucky and uh, very thankful to uh, Covent Garden Market for all the support that they have given us um, since, our, since our creation. Now, people might say, why do you want to have another think tank? Why do you want another policy group? Or, um, and particularly, people talk about the food sector. There are lots of different voices in this particular sector. W when I was in Parliament, what was extraordinary was that there was no independent food think tank looking at the food system. People are looking at different bits of the food sector, but not looking at the overall system and what it means to families. And so I'm thrilled that this first report is looking at the whole journey of our food system onto the plate of an average family in this country. And my observations, and I think my trustees' observations, and certainly Anna Taylor, our fantastic director, um, is that it's not just food poverty that we have to consider, and we do, but it is also the poverty of food that we have to think very, very carefully about. So uh, this is the first report of, of many pieces of work that we'll be doing with expert panels, bringing together the best in the business, um, ensuring that we have got rigor and also learning from other experiences in other sectors. I leave you with one thought, and that is that this country regulates all sorts of different parts of our environment, whether it be uh, children's toys. Ten children in ten years have been admitted to, hol uh, to hospital on the basis of bad, and, uh, bad experiences with children's toys. We have seat belts that protect people. We have air pollution targets, despite VW, um, that is there as a societal good. But we have now got a system of food that is delivering young people to secondary schools um, with very, very serious health, long-term health problems. And I think that we have got to start ensuring that we have a country that is delivering the best for young people, best for society, best for the economy, but also ensuring that we're giving people, we're not serving them a distorted um, menu and d serving it on a plate to them um, as easily as we are at the moment. So I want to say a huge thank you to my team here and Anna Taylor, who will be speaking after me, but also Robin and Alex, who've done a huge job to make this happen today. Um, we're very, very grateful to Esme Fairburn and Nuffield who've been funding us and we will always be taking independent money. We're not in, in the business of representing anybody's um, position. So we're thrilled to be able to say we're partners with Esme and Nuffield. And also Benenden who have been very much part of the publication of our report. Please look at our infographic. Um, I think there's lots of information in there and lots of really important nuggets that actually tell us a big story about the food s system. Um, we have a hashtag called ForceFed and please do use it. My last thank you is to the trustees of the Food Foundation, uh, Rosie Boycott, David Edwards, Charles Godfrey, and Tom Sp Spencer. And we are, it's Tom Lindsay, I apologize. There you go, Tom. Um, this is a group of people who've really worked very, very hard to get us to this stage. And 
we do hope that um, in the future, you know, we'll be looking to your support in terms of ideas and what we need to do to frame the food system to deliver a much better outcome. I want to thank you all and his worship, the uh, Mayor of Lambeth, who is here gracing our presence, and uh, thank you very much for, for attending. So I'd like to hand over to Anna. Oh, to the mayor, absolutely. May I hand over to the mayor? Very good to have my... Uh, and to say uh, a few words of welcome to Lambeth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Um, coming here this morning, I didn't know I was going to meet, I still call you Lambert Gale, because um, Laura's father did represent wonderful part of our borough as an MP long time ago in Stratham. So really good ideas do come from Lambert. Whether Laura agrees with that, but I think those good ideas is fantastic. Food Foundation, what a fantastic thought. Having also spoken to so many people across, having looked at how the links between people who are here and what we eat, from the production to the plate. And I think a, a, a borough like Lambert, our health outcome depends on what we eat. As a, a borough that is so diverse in various ways, that includes what we eat, how we eat, and how do we know what we eat, where it comes from. And I think the discussion and the what you produce in your report, a bit that I've glanced, actually has given me hope that this foundation is going to add value to the way we eat our food, how we market our food, how we advertise our food, and also how we joint work between the government central the local, also agencies that are very much involved in the way we produce food, the way we market food, the way we eat food. My thanks to you and also organizing this event today. Also, absolutely, my gratitude goes to your supporters, those individuals who <coughs> thought that your ideas was supporting, that your ideas is going to make us better people, your ideas will give us the health outcomes we're looking from our children to our adults. And hopefully, uh, people will take away this, your report, take it, look into it, add more values to what you're going to do and give you your support. As an authority, I am absolutely certain that if you need our support, we will be there and work with you because what you, your ideas shows us that we will work in order to really, really achieve that health outcome we will want to achieve as a borough. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and thanks everybody who's also, whether you have woken up earlier <laughs> to be here and also try to support this wonderful market. And again, I thank them for giving you the space and I know that going forward, you will be absolutely a delightful to us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Anna Taylor, um, heading up the team at the Food Foundation. Really delighted to see, um, to see you all here today. Congratulations on finding us. Um, I'm going to take you briefly through the report, which we're launching today, called Force Fed. 
Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, there's a lot that I'm going to skip over because um, there's a lot of detail in the report and would encourage you to read it, um, but I'm going to give you some of the headlines. Um, first of all, um, a quick overview of the report itself. So our starting point was to try and understand the food system in Britain through the lens of a typical family. Um, and what we wanted to do was to understand about their diet, the impact it's having on their health, and then to understand what they were buying, what was in their shopping basket, where they were eating out, where, what their, school, their children's school meal was like, and then trace some of those items back to the farm. That was our starting intention, and what we wanted to do was use as much as possible the national data sets to disaggregate the picture for that family. We've gone for a, an, a median income family. So these are, this is the mi middle 20% of the um, socioeconomic uh, spectrum and we did that very deliberately we had a big discussion about whether to focus on low-income families and felt that if we were focusing in the middle income we'd be getting away from some of the income barriers and getting to the heart of some of the food system challenges so many of the issues that we're highlighting today will be even more relevant for families on a low income so I think it's important to keep that in mind and certainly as we go forward we'll be doing more focused on on low-income families. So this is our family. It's a family of four, a secondary school child and a primary school child. Their, their average income between 37 and 52,000 pounds gross. Um, and these are some of the data sources that we've drawn on. There's a detailed methods paper, which is online. Please do look at that if you've got questions about that. And then the, ch the, the report basically takes you through the journey um, of, their, of their diet and their food. And these are our two questions that we started out with. How easy is it for this typical family to choose a healthy and sustainable diet? Um, I've put sustainable in there. Our focus here is on health, but throughout we try and think about the environmental implications of their diet as well and weave that narrative together because we think it's really important that healthy and sustainable diets becomes part of the, 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 the lexicon. Um, and then we, then we ask, what are the policy levers which should be used to make it easier? So we're really focusing in the report on government policy, whether that's driven in Brussels, local authority level, Whitehall, devolved, devolved governments. Um, and we, we're trying to identify, if, if this were to change, what are the levers that government does have? That's not to say that only government can solve these problems, and not at all. Recognise that there's you know, leading work by many businesses, for example, but in order to take some of that work to scale, we need a conducive environment to make that happen. And that's where I think government policy can play a critical role. So this is a snapshot of their diets. Um, we looked at um, seven um, sort of key aspects of their diet which we know are directly linked to health outcomes. And the, the graph at the top shows you in green the, the areas of the diet which are where our family members are not getting enough. And you can see for fibre, for example, that um, the vast majority um, of the, our family members are, are not getting enough fibre, down to oily fish and fruit and veg. And then in the, red, the bars in red show you where their family members are having too much. Um, so for red and processed meat, for example, between 23 and 64 percent of our family members are having too much. Um, this is dependent on age and the different family members. That's why the range is presented there. You'll see all the detailed statistics in the, in the report. And then, of course, standing out there, sugar, where um, virtually uh, entirely our family members are eating too much sugar. Um, in the bottom, we've just, these two pie charts pick out just the primary school children. And we've done a separate analysis of all the areas of uh, all sort of family members' diets from two angles. Question one, how much are our families dependent on high fat sugar and salt foods, or so sugar or salt foods? This is the, the, the classification of a, 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 a less healthy food used by the government for the advertising regulations. And the second pie chart on the right is the proportion of calories coming from highly processed foods. So these are industrially processed foods. And for our primary school child, that's 64% of calories. And for the HFSS foods, it's 47%. The other family members are presented in the report. But this is quite a stark, stark finding, I think. Um, what's happening to their, their health? Well, these are the obesity statistics for our family members. In red, uh, the small people of the children. Um, well, actually, that's the secondary school child is the girl and the primary school child the boy. And then on the 
the adults either side. Red is obese children, uh, uh, obese individuals. Uh, orange is overweight. Um, we've looked at diabetes and dental caries as well for our family members. Um, and then we've also looked at the carbon footprint of their diet. Um, so a typical UK diet is emitting um, the equivalent of dri uh, carbon, carbon dioxide emissions equivalent of driving 5,000 miles a year. And some very interesting research that we highlight from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine shows that actually if we can get our diet a little bit more in line with international recommendations without fundamentally changing our dietary patterns, we can not only deliver great health impacts, but we can also deliver a 17% reduction in emissions attached to um, our diet. So there are clear gains, both from an environmental and a health perspective, by looking at this narrative together. And for that reason, our first recommendation is focused on actually um, calling on the government to have a, a clear vision for healthy and sustainable diets with some very clear action ta uh, sorry, targets around consumption underneath that. Um, and we think this not only builds on the commitments in Paris, um, the climate uh, uh, negotiations, but also the forthcoming, hopefully, childhood obesity strategy. Um, and, and it also creates a, a, a big opportunity to link to the global sustainability goals, which are being sustainable development goals, which are being uh, finalized at the moment. Then we take a look at where their food is coming from. So we look at Kantar data and we look at their shopping list. This is the top 10 items on their shopping list in terms of spend. They're spending about £96 a week on food in shops, largely supermarkets, mostly for supermarkets. Um, these are the things on their list. Now you'll see fruit and veg right at the top, interestingly, might be a surprising result. Um, uh, then we also look at where they're eating out. So uh, 54 pounds is spent eating out, um, a whole range of different places that might be eating at work. Um, but when you look at the statistics on where most eaten out meals are eaten, they're eaten in um, quick service restaurants. Um, in fact, I think it's the Horizons data shows us it's two billion, year, two billion meals a year are eaten in quick service restaurants, about the same as restaurants, pubs, and hotels all combined. So this is the kind of dominant location, if you like, for eating out. Um, and um, when we looked at the market share for quick service restaurants, McDonald's is by far and away the leading, the leading supplier. So we looked in more detail at the McDonald's menu to see what are the opportunities for a healthy meal at McDonald's, um, which wasn't great, actually. The details are in there. Um, but ba basically, a third of the food items on the menu are um, not HFSS foods, not high-fat sugar or salt foods. Um, Two-thirds are... Um, and then we looked briefly at school meals as well and obviously noted the huge um, uptake in school meals in um, infancy now that they're free and we have this fantastic new policy around school meals. Um, but that uptake drops off quite considerably, at least from the latest data we have in the older age groups. And kids are often eating pat lunches, which we know from the research 1% of pat lunches are are deemed of the quality um, nutritionally as a, as a healthy school meal. So there's a, there's a challenge there. And then, of course, there's waste. Um, our family typically throws away the equivalent of about six meals a week. So this is a kind of complicated picture um, around what they're eating and where they're getting it from. What we then do is really try and understand what are some of the drivers, um, the drivers behind this picture. What is it, what are the factors which are, make, are pointing families in the direction towards uh, more unhealthy eating, just from the environment that they're living and working and shopping in? Um, first up is advertising. Um, obviously, a huge um, range of advertising channels available now, particularly through digital, um, many of which are, de are deliberately targeting children. And if we look at comparative Nielsen um, data on where food what food advertising is spent on, 60% of it goes on confectionery and convenience foods, 3% on fruit, veg, and actually pasta is in that same category as in terms of how they organise it. So huge sort of misbalance there. Um, prices, this is Cambridge University research. Um, the cost per calorie of high fat sugar or salt foods compared to non, um, they're three times cheaper. A um, bit of an incentive there, given that price is arguably the, probably the biggest driver of, of, of food choices. 
Um, abundance of places to eat out. Um, we've seen a 50% increase in places to eat out. In fact, the data suggests now that there are more places to eat out than there are places to buy food, such as the big sort of shift that we've seen in uh, availability of food just around us. And, and that's not to say that this is these, these, uh, these places are all serving up unhealthy food, of course. But um, we know that quick service is, is the dominant force and, then, and, and that not all of those meals are, are as healthy as they could be. Then there's promotions. This is the Public Health England research that was published uh, last year, telling us that we buy a lot on promotion, 40% of our food, more of it is unhealthy than healthy, and that's causing us to buy 20% more than we otherwise would. Then we looked at four categories. You, you saw the shopping list. Um, we actually looked within the top 20 items of the family shopping list, and we picked four categories that we felt could be healthy um, as well as unhealthy. We wanted to pick categories that where there was a kind of a fair chance, if you like. And we looked at labels um, and, form, uh, to an extent, formulations in those categories. And we looked across four different, uh, the four of the major retailers. Um, these are the results. Um, you can see that we, we looked at ready meals, breakfast, cereals, yogurts, and bread, and um, we've looked at their labels, so their traffic lights labels. So you can see that 55% um, of ready meals had uh, at least one red label, and a very small minority had all green. Um, so this points to, you know, if you, it, and look at the numbers of, this is interesting, the numbers of these products available, 411 ready meals on offer in Sainsbury's. Um, but with only, with, but still with half, more than half of them with, a, with at least one red. Um, uh, and then, we, then we, we thought, well, if our family gets this far and they've managed to navigate the advertising and the convenience and all the other things which are pointing them in a wrong direction, we then get to labels. And then it's really good luck from there on because there is a huge number of kind of trip-ups, if you like, for trying to navigate the labeling situation. <laughs> You've got it, uh, some using colored traffic lights, some not. Portion sizes being different for the same product between traffic lights, which makes them really hard to interpret. You've got um, some date labeling still appearing on fruit and veg, which um, is more for stock purposes, display until, rather than actually showing when, the, when something's going to be unsuitable for eating, which is obviously contributing to the waste picture. We've got food hygiene rating on our, on our eating out establishments, but in England and Scotland, it's not mandatory to display those. Um, and, and then we've got this kind of inconsistency between health and nutrient claims and traffic lights. So you can have a health or a nutrient claim on a product, um, but still they can be high in, in, other, in other nutrients, fat, sugar, for example. So you've got this kind of conflicting message where you think, oh, it's, it's low fat, but then it might be high sugar. Um, so it's a conf very confusing environment. So our second recommendation is really about trying to put in place um, a, more, a, a more rigorous set of measures to protect families and, and make the, the playing field a little bit more even between healthy and unhealthy and with a particular focus on children because obviously it's, it's them that we need to protect given the lifelong impacts of, of poor diets on, on them. Um, and we focus on some recommendations around advertising and marketing code, which would be much more reach, far-reaching than the current regulations around high-fat, sugar, and salt foods. Clarifying planning policies near schools, which is still confusing, and we see inconsistent application of that around fast food outlets. Labeling, a whole bunch of things which we've mentioned. Formulation, upper limits. There are st you can still buy some products where the po within one portion you exceed your daily allowance of sugar, for example. And then um, really trying to build on all the great work that the school food plan has done to um, get uh, increased uptake in the, uh, in the um, older years of, sco of, of school, beyond infancy. Next, we take four items in our family's basket. Potatoes, that was the, the biggest vegetable in their vegetable, even though you can argue whether it's a vegetable, but um, in, their, in their shopping list. A whole chicken. Uh, fresh beef mince and a Muller Crunch Corner. Muller is the leading yogurt brand and yogurts were in our top 20 items. We picked these items because we wanted to dig a bit more deeper into the challenging areas of the diet. So we know that fibre is low, 
uh, potatoes are an important source of fiber. We know that meat consumption is high, but well, red and processed meat consumption. Um, but generally, we're eating a lot of protein, more than we need, and we know that there's a big carbon footprint attached to that meat. And then the Muller Crunch Corner, we looked at as an example of a, f uh, a highly processed food, which, um, which could be healthy. Um, and you know, people tend to think is, is healthy, in fact. Um, and what we do is we kind of ask the question, why have we got this problem with price, where the, he the healthy things are, uh, are too expensive and the unhealthy things are too cheap? And we try and look at what are the cost drivers which are contributing to those price points, and where does the government policy um, have an indirect, often, impact on those costs? And I'm not going to detail them now, there's not time, but these are some of the areas ranging from feed-in tariffs for anaerobic digestion and the impacts on land rents, which is affecting vegetable production, through to um, the, the, the uh, discrepancies in how the common agricultural policy applies to different sectors of food, um, through to competition regulations, waste, waste targets, and so forth. So there's a whole description of what we try to get to here is that it's not that just price just happens at, at, you know, in our shopping basket. There are a whole number of levers which are indirectly affecting that, and those are ones which the government could deliberately try to adjust to give us a better balance of costs. So this is our third recommendation, trying to really get to the heart of that balance of costs. Sugary drinks tax is, is obviously a great place to start. There's opportunities with VAT <coughs> and waste, and we're calling for an EFRA inquiry into vegetables, particularly given what's going on with the sector there. And then recommendation four is the last one. W this really came out of our, our experience with trying to trace back the Muller yogurt. You can't actually find out how much sugar is added to a Muller yogurt, even if you ask them. Um, and we had to deduce it based on um, the calcium content. And actually, the Muller yogurt has 90% of a primary, of a, a four to six year old child's sugar intake. So, in one yogurt. So, um, but we should know that. We should be able to find that out. Um, there's obviously a labeling question, but there's a much bigger question around processed food and the black box that's currently around it. And we think there needs to be stronger transparency standards around that black box so that we can find out if you're an interested consumer. Um, and then in, in, in another area of food that we think needs more transparency is around meat, how it's produced, and the carbon footprint attached to it, given that many consumers are, 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 are very unaware of that. So if there's one thing that you take from this report, it's this. This is not a level playing field for healthy and unhealthy foods. And what we think we need to move towards is government policy, which is trying to make that a bit more of a level playing field to give typical families in Britain a better chance of ending up with a better diet. And just a final thank you to the contributors to the report, Jenny, Sutherland and Fiona, who have been fantastic doing the research, and obviously the team that, that, um, that's already been thanked. Um, and there's a full list of acknowledgements in the report. So I know many of you have helped us, so thank you. Thanks. Uh, can we have the panel up, please? And perhaps you'd like to sit in the order in which you're on my programme to make life easy. <laughs> so, um, um, uh, John here. Yeah. Uh, then Kerry. Then Rosie. Then Peter. And then Kate. And Laura, why don't you come up as well and take this chair? And Anna, you have that one. Oh, we've run out of what? Am I here? Yes, please. Oh. No, you're there. Last you're there. But not least. Well, we might. Who knows which end we'll start? <laughs> uh, I'm Simon Maxwell. Good morning. Thanks for coming. And. Well done to the uh, Food Foundation and to Laura and, and Anna and all your team. I'm a member of the board of the International Food Policy Research Institute and also come from a think tank background. And I think we should all say we're delighted to have another think tank in London and one working on food and one which will contribute domestically but also, I think, to the international uh, debate. 
Now, we're going to have some contributions from a very distinguished panel whom I will introduce in a second, but also this is your session, and we want to make sure this is an interactive discussion. So I guess there are two questions. I'm going to ask you just to indicate a very preliminary and rough um, judgment on those questions. Uh, the first question is, is the analysis right? And put up your hands if you agree that the analysis is right. Um, put up your hands if you have reservations about the analysis. Um, please make sure you contribute to the discussion in due course. And please put up your hands if uh, you weren't listening or were thinking about something else or abstain. <laughs> abstain on the question. Or haven't, or haven't read the report, indeed. So uh, I, I think we should not just assume that the analysis is taken 100% without question and we do need to have a bit of a debate about it. And then the other question is... Um, are the recommendations plausible? It's always interesting in this debate that, that when you look at the poor quality of people's diets, sometimes we blame the consumers, sometimes we blame industry, and sometimes we blame the government, and sometimes we blame all three. I'm glad you didn't actually just blame the consumers because sometimes that is a, a temptation some people fall into. And you've put very much the focus here on government. Put up your hands if you think this is a plausible platform from the Food Foundation. Put up your hands if you think it isn't. Okay, so there are one or two dissenting voices there as well, and we want to hear from you. So let's try and address those two questions. Are the recommendations right? And um, is, there, is there a plausible platform for the Food Foundation in, in the future? Our panel consists of uh, uh, five people, but we've got Laura and Anna with us as well. First of all, uh, John Glenn, MP, MP for Bath, but with, I think, a farming Salisbury. background. Salisbury. Salisbury, I'm so sorry. Salisbury, but with a farming background. Um, uh, Kerry McCarthy, who's a Shadow Secretary of State for DEFRA um, and a campaigner on this issue. Uh, Rosie Boycott, uh, many hats, but including Chair of London Food. Uh, Peter Backman, who's a specialist in um, the eating out business. Uh, it has another name, doesn't it? What's its proper name? Food sorry? Food Service, anyway, is Managing Director of Horizons, and Kate Cooper, who's from the Chair of the Birmingham Food Council. And actually, Kate, apologies, but I'm going to start at this end and work along. Now, what we've asked the panellists to do is to speak for not more than two to three minutes each and make kind of one or two points, and this is not the opportunity for a sort of long speech because we want to make sure the audience participate. So, John, show us the way and... and okay, thank, thank you thank very you. much, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, about two years ago... Uh, I helped set up with Frank Field the APPG on hunger and food poverty in Parliament. And my good friend Laura Sands was a bit reticent about joining because, quite reasonably, she thought that it wouldn't get to the heart of the problem. And two years later, she ha is getting to the heart of the problem, I think, with this launch today. Because one of the things that I recognise, and I grew up on a glasshouse nursery next to an agricultural college in in North Wiltshire, and uh, I now represent Salisbury with Public Health England at Porton on my, on my doorstep, is that we need a radical approach that joins up all the different elements that need to respond to the crisis that I recognise. Because when I think about hunger and food poverty and the, the pattern of food bank usage, there's a big debate over the causes and the situation of people using those food banks, but it seems to me pretty outrageous <coughs> that we have people who are in some communities in this country which are experiencing simultaneously obesity and malnutrition. And at the heart of it is a dysfunctional system for delivering food to people in this country. And the way of solving it will need a radical approach, an ambitious approach, across the whole supply chain, and it will also need a serious shift in attitudes and understanding of what healthy eating and healthy food is about. And I just get very frustrated when we debate these things in Parliament that it's, it seems to be, well, if we just tweak the labels, if we just give a bit more information, we give people the freedom to choose, and that's something we must cherish, and people will make wise decisions. Now, it seems to me, despite some welcome improvements in labelling, they are modest. And I think what this report does is actually look more fundamentally at the underlying challenges in terms of changing 
advertising, changing an understanding of where food comes from, how much processed food we consume, so that people have a complete picture and we can really work particularly with young people to actually change at source at the earliest stages of life an understanding of what we need to eat to be healthy. And it is a massive challenge, one that's understated. And I, I you know, massively support this organisation and the work that you will do and these recommendations. And as I uh, wa watch the presentation, all of it makes sense. The challenge, I think, for politicians and for all parties and government generally is to make it all stack up together. Because unless you do all of these elements and you look at it right from uh, you know, farming through to consumer behaviour, you won't affect the change that I think probably everyone in this room wishes to see. Thank you. An underlying question which you kind of hint at, when you say the food system is dysfunctional, why? Well, because there are too many... That the prize at the end of making a profit from the consumer is a big one. And if you can get everyone consuming certain types of food in certain, t certain quantities, you can make a lot of money. And therefore, we've become very sophisticated in how we manage information and some of the small steps incrementally that have been made in, in positive ways towards uh, more nutritious and better food hides some of the underlying uh, truths around uh, overall poor diet that we have in, in, and obesity that we see emerging in this country. So... I think it comes down to the economics of food, and I think there are other ways of doing it that can deliver you know, massively different outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. Kerry. Okay, um, is this on? Um, I don't think there's anything I can disagree with with what John's just said, and I'm really glad that there is cross-party working on this. That's the way that we're going to change hearts and minds at the top of the people that are, are the ones that uh, need to be won over. Um, and I, th I think particularly what John said about we need to look at the food system from farming <laughs> all the way through to what actually ends up on people's plates, or actually further than that, to what ends up in people's bins. I'm very keen to remind people, um, I, I often get described as the shadow farming minister, and I'm very keen to remind people that the F in DEFRA stands for food rather than just farming. It's not just about producer interests, although obviously we need to look at how we can make the farming system in this country uh, economically viable, environmentally sustainable, um, and, and, and so on. So um, it is about looking at it all the, all the way through. Um, just a quick plug, I've got my food waste bill up in Parliament next Friday. I'm hoping that John's colleagues will not feel the need to talk for an hour at a time about things that are only tangentially re <laughs> relevant to the subject matter um, because uh, there's a d it's third on the list, so there's a danger that it could be talked out. But it's, it's basically calling for us to meet the Sustainable Development Goal target of halving food waste by 2030, which I think is a hugely important um, issue. But the thing, the thing I think that is, is so important about the report today is that link between what people eat and, and public health, which is a huge cost to the public purse. So even if other arguments don't work, you would think that the need to save the NHS from the cost of obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, asthma, there's reports that suggest that um, consumption of fast food contributes to childhood asthma and allergies um, and even behaviour. There's been some really interesting reports on uh, changing the diets that you feed to young offenders in young offender institutions and how it radically alters their, their, um, their mental state. So all these things are really important. And how we can change food consumption from being about calorie intake to being about nutrient intake because at the moment, th as, as the, some of the statistics there show, it is very much just about uh, people would look at how they restrict their calorie intake if they want to lose weight and so on. And the final thing I would say, on the, on the issue of choice, again, I totally agree with John, because quite often it's posited as being about we need to just give people information so they can make the choice. And we know that the information out there is incredibly confusing. Um, so... Definitely more work needs to be done on labelling and public education. But as, as John said, I, d I don't think that goes far enough. I think if you look at things like the public health responsibility deal, which has now collapsed, you know, that has, has definitely got to be the way forward that you don't just change um, what people are being told about what's on the shelves. You change what is on the shelves as well. Just, just to pick up my... Thank you. Just to pick up my question to John, but turn it around a bit. Um, don't you think that, that 
manufacturers have a role to play in this without having a great deal of additional regulation imposed on them? Well, this is ex exactly what I was just saying about the public health responsibility deal. So that achieved um, some quite good things on, on salt in food. So it wasn't just a public education campaign about the, the link between salt consumption and certain health conditions. Manufacturers actually looked at how they could alter the recipes and gradually reduce the, the salt content of food without people even really noticing. Um, but as I said, you know, that has now stopped. It's not being renewed. Um, quite a lot of people pulled out of it. And um, if you look at what's happening, say, on sugar consumption, yeah, very clearly there is a responsibility. You know, if we could get manufacturers to make healthier breakfast cereals and gradually wean people off of looking for the high sugar content. I think I'm right in saying that a lot of confectionery in the UK has higher sugar content than the almost like, you know, what looks mm. like an identical brand that is sold elsewhere in Europe because our tastes mm. are, um, are sweeter. And, and you know, ma yeah, d definitely manufacturers. And it, it doesn't have to be regulation, but as I say with the food waste bill, the problem is you can point to lots of examples of supermarkets starting to tackle food waste. Um, so Tesco's are doing food waste audits, Morrison's has sort of come up with something after the Hugh Fernley Whittenstall program. But it's really slow progress. And if you actually really want to, if you want to meet the target that we've set ourselves, you have to okay. do something more concrete than that. Thank you very much. Rosie, just hang on one second, if you don't mind. Um, I meant to say earlier on, we're on the record. Uh, just before we move to the other three speakers, I want to give you an opportunity to participate. Uh, and the rules are these. Please stand up, say something completely fascinating in less than 60 seconds and sit down again. And you're not allowed to ask questions. What we want is contributions to the conversation. And I'd like particularly to hear from people who feel very strongly about the analysis in the report. We'll start with you, sir, and then take a couple of others, but really brief, please. Not a speech, a one comment. There's a microphone behind you. Say who you are. Hello, my name is Ray Warford. Uh, I run We Care Food Bank in Deptford, South London. It's the largest independent food bank in the UK. I've written a book called Food Bank Britain, which exposes what's going on with the rise of food banks. And I'm presently advising supermarkets in Europe about what to do with food waste. Just some quick points that I think really important people are missing. One of them is uh, VAT. VAT on food banks. Would you believe it that food banks, three million people used food banks last year. Most people only take the trust or trust figures. But food banks have to pay VAT on the food, which is crazy. The other big issue, is, of course, is access to cooking facilities. There's many people, particularly under 35 years, who now have uh, no access to social housing. So they don't have the facilities to actually cook the food. We talk about labelling. Most people, it's about price. In Deptford, you can buy chicken and chips for 99p. If you're a household, you cannot do that. We need labelling, which reflects a price, and to stop supermarkets from loss-leading certain types of brand okay, to get market share. And the, the Jerry made a really important point about the cost and the impact on health and the NHS, but it also has a real impact on children's life chances and crime is a really big issue. And if we can win the economic argument, that's what people understand is how every taxpayer pays for the cost of failing to eradicate food poverty. And I think Very that good. really needs to be addressed. Thanks for being brief. You may get another chance later on. Anybody else want to come in quickly at this point? Any more contributions? Okay, I think that point about VAT and cooking facilities is very important. Rosie, let's go to you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't think we're anything like angry enough about all of this. I think this report <coughs> is fantastically good because I think it absolutely takes you through how incredibly difficult, even with the best will in the world, it is to eat healthily. Everything is stacked against us. Everything is stacked towards supermarkets making more money. They are responsible not to us. They are responsible to their shareholders. Um, if we do not get our government to make some kind of legislation, with the best will in the world and all the great attempts by everybody on the grassroots, which is hundreds of wonderful people in London, we are never going to change this system. I am extremely worried that what we're going to see in the obesity report is more passing it back to industry. Yes, of course, industry would like to make a lot of money selling broccoli. The fact of the matter is they don't make any money out of selling broccoli. They make nothing. They make money, as uh, Anna's report has shown, they make it out of the processed foods. 
I was with someone from Tesco's, Tesco's head of comms yesterday, and he was saying, we want the government to give us regulation because then we have some kind of yardstick on which to work. What in fact happens is the day after Jamie Oliver's program about sugar, which was fantastic, Coca-Cola takes the three-page adverts in the Standard, the Mail, and the Express, and they say on the first page, Coca-Cola equals happiness. On the second page, there is a Coca-Cola for you with all their different calories. And on the third page, a whole page, Coca-Cola makes 41,000 jobs in Britain. This is the tank on the lawn of the Treasury. We've got to get wise to this. So as a city, there is masses we can do. As a city, I think that cities created the food problem because we have grown according to the food that can be brought in. Every day in London, we dish out 33 million meals, give or take a few. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> what government has got the guts to walk up to a system that delivers 33 million meals a day? They might be rubbish meals, but they're there, and start to say, we've got to change it. Somehow, as a group of people, we have to give the government the guts to say, we cannot have this time bomb. Laura made the point that 10 children go to hospital because of bad toys. I mean, the regulation about toys is fantastic. How many children are in hospital with no teeth? Babies, there was a report in the Express this week, babies going into hospital because they're so obese they can't roll over. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, everything is too soppy. I'm sorry, it makes me so cross. And then you, you, know, you talk about your food bank and we've got people, we've got kids who can't learn all the way through. Um, Anna's family is pretty well off compared to a lot of people who are stuck with the 99p chicken and chips. So I'm sorry, this is just, I think, that as the Food Foundation and as all of us in this room, before this obesity report comes out, we have to get some kind of serious government regulation. Yes, there are wonderful people who will pick it up immediately and help change the system, and we can do it. But we're not going to get it while we are dominated by the big food companies. Sorry. You know, uh, just... <laughs> I work on international development, so I tend to observe the UK debate, but I've been observing this debate about poor quality food systems in Britain since at least the 1970s, and I remember Tim Lang's work with the London Food Commission going back years. So the point that you're really pointing us to is there has to be a political process to underpin the analysis. And what do, what there has to be some really strong political will which walks up to this. Um, yes, what we need to see in whenever it is, three weeks' time, when I'm told, is all the recommendations, you know, a, a sugar tax, um, a limits on promotions, uh, a real thing of, you know, own brands coming down in sugar contents like we did with salt, um, advertising to children, all this sort of stuff. This can be regulated. People can still make money and people can still eat. You have to start to say, who are we as a government responsible for? Are, is our responsibility actually to the Cargills of this world and to the big supermarkets? Or is our responsibility towards our kids? And, I mean, personally, I don't think that is an argument. Um, but at the moment, apparently, we, we veer on the other side as a government, and it's shocking. Um, maybe uh, Peter will help us with this. What I would love us to be able to do is to make an irresistibly attractive offer also to the food manufacturers so that they become part of but our they, campaign. But, they, and not but the food manufacturers will operate around the regulation, won't they? Yeah. I mean, if you know that if you make stuff that's sugary and yummy, I mean, people will go out and buy it. I mean, as Margaret Chan said just two weeks ago, she said, what is happening in the world is a normal response to an abnormal situation. And if you just consider that that is said by the head of the World Health Organization to when she responds to the food system, yeah, we're all behaving normally. We're getting fatter. That's what's happening. Maybe we'll come back to that debate, Peter. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you've made a mistake choosing me after Rosie, because I'm going to be uh, rather quiet, I'm afraid. Um, I, I'm here really wearing two hats, one as an ordinary Joe in the street and secondly as somebody who knows a little bit about the eating out of home market. Um, my comment as, a, as an ordinary man, uh, or woman, well an ordinary man in the street, <laughs> is that... <laughs> the, uh, the, the report is fantastic. Uh, I, I like its measured and, and analytical tone. I think it's very very good on that score and the conclusions are, are right. Um, however, I think uh, in, in a sense it's a level two discussion. The level one discussion is the, the relationship that we Brits have with food 
our understanding or our lack of understanding of what food is. I've heard the story, and it's probably apocryphal, about children at school who believe that fish fingers are made from the fingers of fish. Um, uh, so we've lost connection with food. We don't know what happens to it. And I'm just throwing that on the table as, a, as an issue, um, um, and I won't pursue it anymore. The, o the other point is, and looking at the eating out of home market, it, it is big, it's very noticeable, um, it's what everybody's talking about, well, a lot of people are talking about, um, but it's also easy to get it out of perspective um, in that although it takes about a third of our expenditure on food, it only takes around about 17% of the volume of food because the, the margin that the operators need to charge for the labour and so on is much higher than the supermarket. So it is a relatively small contribution to our um, uh, to our diet, and it's spread across a wide range of different types of outlets. Qu a quick service is is an important uh, uh, route there, but so are schools. And the people who eat out most in this country are ch school children because they eat out three, three, or up to five times a week in term time. <coughs> so schools uh, and and other sectors are all important. I think the contribution that the eating out of home market can make to the debate is by way of, um, if you like, in, in a simple sense, education. Uh, bringing on board issues about provenance, about quality, innovation, um, health. These all are happening through the food service market. We track what's happening on menus, and some of the fastest growing elements on menus are things like quinoa, chia seeds, uh, and so on. So. Um, I think the food service market is big, it's, um, it covers many, many different sectors, but it has the opportunity to educate um, the public. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go straight to Kate, and then we really want to get a debate with you uh, for the last 20 minutes of the conversation. So, uh, Kate? Are you being recorded? Are you recording it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are recording. Kate, we are recording it, apparently. So. Well, hey, could, could I ask? Well, we'll ask Peter to hold him. Just yeah, don't stand yeah, up, well, but just hold it. Good luck. I like wandering around as well. Oh. Fuck off. There we go. Um, Birmingham is a city of 1.1 million people, but it has virtually no clout at all nationally. So. Basically, as chair of the Birmingham Food Council, we don't pay that much attention to influencing regulation or taxation, valuable though that is. What we do is have a more inward focus. How can a city make a difference? And I'm actually going to use some stuff which we published yesterday. It's on our website. The Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Council Partnership. There's a mouthful. Our local let asked us a month ago to write a briefing paper to influence their economic strategy. So therefore, we're in the business not really of making recommendations. That's not our purpose. Our purpose really is to inform decision makers and try and make some kind of way in which they can think differently. This is the city, incidentally, where one of our traditionally favorite employers is Cadbury's, now Mondelez. Mondelez, you may be interested to know, their advertising has something called mindful snacking, <laughs> which is what your mum and my mum said, spoiling your appetite, don't eat between meals. Now, Public Health England, their healthy choices is funded by all sorts of people in the food industry, including Mars and PepsiCo. We have uh, a healthy eating program in South Birmingham, touching, that's not my word, touching 60,000 primary school children that is funded by Mondelez. Can a city make a difference? Yes, it can. But it needs to consider, we think it's helpful to think in terms of four categories of people who are involved in the food sector. I'm sure there's thousands, but these okay, are four okay, categories. Okay, you'll have to be brief, I'm sorry. Okay, producers, multipliers, controllers, and consumers. 
And we've asked the LEP to set their economic strategy against three criteria. The first one being, how can they expand the economic opportunities of all the interest groups in the sector, i.e. not just producers, but also multipliers, controllers, and consumers. What are, you better tell us what multipliers and controllers are, but then I'm going to have to ask you to be very brief. Uh, secondly, well, you can read that, yeah. Secondly, how can they cost and account for the contribution of all those interest groups? And thirdly, how can they set out short-term tactics to meet longer-term strategic aims? An example of a multiplier would be a trade association, research labs, universities, transport and communication systems. <coughs> Example of controllers, national government, sure, local authorities and NGOs, policy makers, food assurance and food safety organizations. We think this is helpful and we think those three questions are helpful too. Can I just finish with one story? I was in a supermarket queue at Tesco's a few years ago, and in front of me was a woman, plumpish, about 20, 21, and she had twin daughters aged two months in a pushchair next to her. One of those twins was fast asleep. The other twin had a bottle in its mouth that she was holding, which contained a pink liquid. I cannot believe that woman didn't have the best interests of her twins at heart. But there isn't a pink liquid, I suspect, that current juice, that a two-month-old infant should be eating, should be drinking. I suspect it was a result of advertising about vitamin C. Okay. Leave it on that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to ask you to be brief. Okay, we've got um, 10 minutes, just over 10 minutes. That gives a chance for 10 people to say something. If you're really quick, stand up, say who you are, be fascinating, sit down. Yes, please. My name is Theresa Wickham. I'm on the board of the Market Authority, so uh, thank you, and we're delighted to have you here. Could I just say very quickly, if you wonder why you walk through all this empty space, we're rebuilding the market. The flower market will move next October, and you will still have a fruit and veg market on this site, but it'll be different over the next seven years. So um, we're not wasting space, but it's like that. Um, I'm also an apple grower, and I'd just like to say something. Whenever I hear you've got to have more regulation. Can I tell you what it's like as an apple grower and any small business grower? There's too much regulation. Whilst I absolutely support what you're doing, I haven't read the report yet, so I can't comment on it, I would like to say, is there a way you can look at more of a carrot than a stick? What we're doing in the farming industry now is a lot of trials on going right back to the soil and the animal to get a better nutritious product onto the, um, the shelves at the end of the day without the consumer having to feel guilty whether they're buying it or not. So I think the Food Foundation should look in that area as well. So better eggs, better meat. People will eat less meat because it's expensive, but it might be better for them. There might be better products. So just to plea, less regulation and a bit more carrot. Better carrots, the better carrots. Very good. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, good morning. My name is Mark Varney from Fairshare Food Redistribution Charity. Um, please support Kerry's bill around food waste. It's incredibly important. My point is actually about sugar, because uh, sugar tax is only mentioned once by Rosie, which surprised me. Having worked in the food industry for 20 years, I would have thought the approach to change behaviours with the industry is actually to tax sugar as an ingredient rather than as an output. There seems to be a lot of focus about sugar in soft drinks and cereals. Why not tax it as an ingredient and actually change the behaviours of the manufacturers that way. Good, thank you. Uh, two over here, three over here, and then and two more, and then we'll see whether... We, I want to give the panel the chance to come back on the discussion as well. Thank you. Uh, Sue Dib from the Eating Better Alliance. I want to say how great I think this report is, and thank you for producing it. It's much needed. What I like about the report is it talks about real people, takes all those statistics that are there for everyone to use but relates it to real people and real lives. Secondly, it takes on and challenges the government to show some leadership on all of this and that is very much needed. And thirdly, it's great because it doesn't just talk about healthy diets, it talks about sustainable diets and it's really important that we start to integrate those two concepts into one thing and food is the place that we can start. I hope this report will make people angry things need to change. I'm sure you'll be sharing it far and wide. 
and that anger needs to turn into action and we'll be supporting and encouraging you on that. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, behind you. Um, so I'm Alison Tedstone from Public Health England um, and by the way we don't have funding from the manufacturers you suggested supporting our campaigning. Um, I'm really delighted to see this report and I'm really delighted to see a focus on middle income families. I think there's always a bit of a narrative that um, it's about the poor uneducated that are driving the health problems in this country and for this agenda that is absolutely not true. The average consumer has a poor diet and all these structural cues are driving it. I suppose um, um, I work with the team that, are that will be have their work program determined by the childhood obesity strategy that we are expecting in the next few days. <laughs> and when I think about what I want the team to be doing over the next five years, it is the structural end of this debate that will deliver change. And with all the best will in the world, better and better food labels, although they are an important part of the mix, will not deliver the changes we would like to see. We know that, um, even though I would support better labeling, um, uh, we know that most people, no matter how good and how innovative those labels are, will not engage with them. So it's structural things, and I would really urge a focus on the structural end of this equation. Thanks. Do you have a view, just very, very briefly, on this carrots versus sticks issue? Um, as Rosie says, economic drivers are key to this. And um, yes, there are economic incentives for better, but I'm afraid sticks have to be part of the equation. Um, OK, that's good enough. Can I just say one thing about the out-of-home industry? Because they are very important. And um, they have been very slow to step up to improve diets. One of the panel mentioned the excellent work on salt. It is very noticeable that the majority of the out-of-home industry have not participated in that. There is no reason why a pizza bought from a retailer should have far less salt than a pizza bought from any of the leading okay. out-of-home chains. Thank you. Um, person behind you, and then we'll take two more maybe three if we have time, but really brief. Great. Um, I'm lucky enough to make a living off the land. I'm here. Who are you? Who are you? Um, yeah, I'm Elizabeth from the, I'm here as a core group member of the Land Workers Alliance, which represents a union of small scale farmers and food growers that are growing in an agro, agroecological um, way. And I just want to say that I'm really excited to share this report with my colleagues and coworkers and other people in the Alliance. Um, and I think that this, the Food Foundation should really come to the producers, come to the apple growers, come to the veg producers, and start asking us questions about, you know, these structural inequalities. Okay. Access to land, supply chains. If we change the way we grow and produce food to include, we will create more jobs, we will create more access to affordable fruit and vegetables. So yeah, looking Thank forward to much. working with you. Okay, if you can be really quick, we'll take you and then Jeff and then the chap in the glasses at the back. Uh, thank you. Peter Melcher from the Soil Association. I'm also a farmer and I'm delighted that the Food Foundation are linking what happens on farms and what drives farm production with the food system. That's been neglected, as Kerry said, the F in DEFRA stands for food, but that link is not made and it needs to be. And how we farm does affect the quality of the food people eat. There are a couple of papers coming out shortly looking at organic versus non-organic milk and meat, which will underline that message. The other thing I wanted to agree with strongly was Rosie's anger and this idea that doing deals, <coughs> Kerry mentioned the responsibility deal, with big companies whose interests are completely the opposite to the public interest is going to get us anywhere. It's clearly not. The most depressing thing, I think, about the politics of this is that you do see, we see, for example, in soil associations, Food for Life scheme now covers half the schools in England. Uh, we've seen big changes in some of the restaurant chains as a result of a league table we published called Out to Lunch. But politicians are miles behind what some of the good changes that are happening, and they're scared even to go as far as that. Okay. That's got to change. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jeff. Thanks. Jeff Tansey, Chair of the Fabian Commission on Food and Poverty. 
these are all connected, as you said, Laura, right across the population. My concern is what we do and how we get political change. Um, there's a follow-up work happening from our project, and I think we need to connect the Food Foundation and these recommendations with ours, and to get, I've, I've written to all the political leaders, pathetic responses. We, we have very clear recommendations. They do connect very closely with your recommendations. We need to work together across, both from the ground up and through the Westminster networks, and I hope we can actually make some connections. Food Ethics Council as well, which I'm a, a member of, across the board, but bringing these things together at the different levels, from the grassroots through to the Thank others. You. Thanks, and last but not least. Hi there, I'm Jonathan Pauling from Alexander Rose Charity. Um, we run a small uh, uh, healthy eating and food poverty project called the Rose Voucher for Fruit and Veg. Um, the, the, from the report, which sounds great, um, the, the, from the presentation that Anna gave, the, the, the slide that really struck me was the was the balancing scales of, you know, the calories, how, how much the cost for unhealthy calories is and how much the cost is for healthy calories. And we're talking a lot about taxing sugar and taxing the unhealthy foods, but I don't know if that's going to swing the pendulum to make affordable food, uh, sorry, healthy food, as affordable or more affordable than the unhealthy food. So what are we thinking about the subsidisation perhaps, of instead of regulation that might hurt your apple growers, how about subsidies for the apple growers so that we can get healthier food onto okay. the table of people? Thank you. I'm going to come now, starting with Kate, coming down the panel and give Laura the last word and you'll also close the session. Uh, I think there is a very strong endorsement for uh, what um, John described as an as a analysis which shows a dysfunctional food system. Um, and the report does lay it out in great detail and I hope you all get a chance to read it. Um, there is, I think, strong endorsement that, quote, something should be done, unquote. And the question is, A, who, and B, how do we get there? And we've heard a, an interesting opening of a discussion about how we can get the industry to be more on side, the balance of sticks and carrots. You know, looking across to, for example, environment and sustainability in supply chains, actually, industry is taking a lot of initiatives if they can be encouraged and incentivized to do so. Is it about subsidies? Is it about taxes? But clearly, government regulation is important. Why have we had this conversation over and over again for 30 years in the UK? How do we build on Rosie's idea that we need to use think tank analysis in order to deliver a political process which will actually bring change about? So I'm going to ask you to say one thing only, a message for people to take away from this meeting, starting with Kate, working down. But we are supposed to finish about now, so please make it really brief. Yeah. Um, if you can't hold half a dozen ideas about food that are conflicting with each other before breakfast, you're not thinking. And all of these issues are complex and complicated and everything else. There isn't an answer. There isn't the answer. There's lots and lots of different things that we all have to do, some of which will work and some of which won't. So it's a multifaceted, let's learn by doing approach. Very good, thank you. Peter. Thank you. Um, I will take the, uh, the dysfunctional analysis and to say that absolutely agree. And I think a, a, an important element in the solution is education, making people aware of what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Rosie? Um, thank you. Just picking up from Jonathan Pauling's point just now about, you know, we do have to also provide healthy food that is affordable. I agreed with him about that slide. It's very scary that. Um, I think one of our big opportunities possibly is in climate change regulation, food system contributes 30% to overall greenhouse gases. Uh, sooner or later, the world has got to walk up to food. At the moment, we just concentrate on transport. In fact, greenhouse gases from food are produced, uh, food is producing more greenhouse gas than the whole of the transport system of London combined. So there is an opportunity here for the same kind of tax and subsidy help that we put into wind power, solar panels, coming into the food system, which has the beauty of, it's a win-win for everybody. And I think that uh, as a city, I want to see London undertake a pledge to reduce the carbon emissions from food by 20% over the next four years. And that will have all sorts of uh, actually really good things could, actually there's no bad side to that. And it's something that uh, even the, the, the naysayers could coalesce around. Very good, thank you, Kerry. Okay, um, I, I think that what I take away from this is that, I mean, this report has done a, an excellent job in outlining the scale of the problem. 
and other people such as Jamie Oliver have, have done the same. What I want to do next is, I, I still think there's a huge job of work to be done in getting that information across to people, building a coalition, persuading more people of the scale of the problem that something needs to be done. But what I want to go away and look at is what are the mechanisms for actually, you know, people have talked about the need for regulation rather than just nudging things along. Um, I want to go away and look at what mechanisms are there that could actually bring this forward more, so more quickly. Thank you. Uh, 30 years ago, I enjoyed sitting down to gold top milk and bacon and eggs for breakfast. And now I'd have porridge with blueberries on top. Um, the reality is that we'll need regulatory change, but we'll also need to change mindsets, attitudes and appetites to menus. And I feel very strongly that actually, if the public were aware of the depth of the challenge and the problem that they face in their own health, their appetites will change, their demand profile will change, and this sort of uh, regulation that is seen as the, is the only way will, won't pr be the case, because actually, if you have the whole of the country changing habits in a significant way, you will change what producers produce, and that will be significant in itself. And I hope that we can that this report launches a real meaningful debate about what we consume and what we need to consume to, to lead healthy lives. Very good, thank you. Anna, last word from you. Um, yeah, just to say that we're, this is on, but we're really keen <laughs> to take forward um, some more work on vegetables and horticulture on the back of this report, um, particularly building on the comments which Teresa and Jonathan made about what are the incentives which will allow us to get a better price for both producers and consumers. Um, around vegetables and what are the government levers that we could be pushing for on that. So if others want to get involved and collaborate with us on that, then please do um, get in touch. Thanks. Very good. Uh, Laura, you've got from this group a strong endorsement for the creation of the Food Foundation and many congratulations on that. And I think a lot of people who want to support and collaborate, you've got strong endorsement for the core analysis um, of the report and strong encouragement to take forward the policy process that will deliver some of the recommendations you made. I suppose my own final thought is that um, we have to be careful not to get trapped in a very negative message about this. Uh, and I see this in development and in climate change all the time. Martin Luther King did not stand up and say, uh, I have a nightmare. <laughs> you know, he said, I have a dream. And I think we've heard some very interesting examples of how a good diet can improve learning, can improve health, can improve behaviour in, in, in institutions and so on. And maybe we need to get the right balance between being you know, relentlessly negative but also optimistic and positive about the possibility of change. And I know you will do that. Good luck and you're going to close the meeting. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, Simon, and thank you for being a fantastic chair. And it's great to have... I mean, in this room we have got a lot of people that we want to learn from, we want to work with, and we want to draw on the, your expertise and your analysis of, of what the problems are that we need solving. I don't think there's anybody on the panel, I don't think anybody in this room thinks that there is one policy to sort this out. Um, as Alison rightly says from Public Health England, this is a very long campaign because we have got an institutionalized food system that's been in place for decades. It's not going to take any of us just a few months to, to reverse that. But we have got to focus government on one thing when that is the health outcomes of our children, the absolute long-term chronic diseases that we are allowing uh, families to consume. I don't know whether anybody saw The Economist last week, um, but there was a very interesting little statement saying that laboratory rats were given either cocaine or sugar, and they were more addicted to sugar than they were to cocaine. So we have got to look at this, is are we actually delivering a clean and healthy diet? We know we're not, but some of it um, could be said to be almost addictive and poisonous for particularly small children. So I think we've got a big responsibility here and we've got a big campaign which will take many years, many work, many people and many ideas. And we really, really welcome everybody in this room and thank you for being part of our launch today. So congratulations and thank you very much. And thank you to a fabulous panel. <laughs> Just... 
just to close the meeting, as I said, we do have um, Anna Taylor, who is a, a great uh, director. Um, our doors are always open. As I say, we're all here to listen to your ideas. Um, we will be in promoting this report very uh, actively and aggressively and hope that we might be able to call on your support in the areas that you feel strongly about. Thank you very much. Thank you to Covent Garden and thank you all for making it here today this morning.